first and foremost, uh, FBMRS fellowship, as it's known, has a dual structure. Can you explain this to us? The dual structure uh, came about uh, when the Board of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as the Board of Urology, uh, got together and decided that they wanted to have a subspecialty in uh, female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. And they were motivated, I think, by, you know, I wasn't part of that original uh, group, but they were motivated by the fact that both specialties were doing, you know, were seeing patients with pelvic floor conditions. And OB has a long history of having subspecialists uh, that are certified. And urology, we have really not had that in our specialty. We have really, uh, a general urology is, is as urologists, you're really sort of able to do all of the things that we do in urology. Pediatrics was one of the first, and for a long time, the only subspecialty that we had. So this was a little bit of a departure for the Board of Urology, but they felt that they needed to do that because of the, of the direction that the OB pro programs were going, and felt that if OB had certificates and urologists did not in this field that the obstetricians would take, you know, take it from us uh, as, a, as a specialty. So what they did was they came together and they said that it, you could get subspecialty certification in FPMRS for, uh, well, one of two routes. You could either be uh, go through an ACGME approved OBGYN program as a resident or graduate from an ACGME urology program as a resident. And then depending on whether you were urology or OB, you would either have to do three years for obstetricians, for OBGYN, and you would do two years of fellowship training uh, as a urologist. So, that so in that regard, do all programs, say urology program will accept a GYN trainee and vice versa, a GYN led program will accept urology trained uh, residents? So yeah, the way the programs are set up now are they generally are considered either an OB GYN sort of um, derived out of the OB GYN or derived out of urology. And while I think the intent is there for either uh, OB GYN or urologists to train at those. It, due to the funding mechanisms and the way the programs are set up, not all programs will accept both types of residents. So that is one of the things that you have to do as an applicant uh, is you have to understand, you have to go on the, each of the program uh, websites and understand is this a program that will accept whatever residency you came from. Some programs will do it on a, on a, a, a like periodic level. So like one year they will be accepting both the urology and OBGYN, but then the following year they would only have a position for a urologist. Maybe the following year they would have a position for both. And so it varies how many, from program to program. How many urology led programs are there? So we have 17 ACGME approved two year programs that are recognized by both boards. And we have 14 unaccredited, usually one year programs uh, in urology. And the obstetricians have uh, 44 programs uh, that are ACGME approved and they don't have really any unaccredited programs. So most all of their programs are, are accredited. The the situation for the accreditation, as of 2010, in order for the Board of Urology to recognize you as a female pelvic medicine reconstructive surgery subspecialist, after 2010, you have to have had one of the, you have to have the specialty training in an accredited program. So um, is the match a common match for all the programs? It is currently a common match. It's a little bit different. Well, it, it is different than all of the other urology fellowship programs. The AUA runs 
our residency match as well as all the other fellowship matches the AUA always has and the the other match participate in the uh, ERAS, you know, the, the uh, AAMC match that is run nationally. And the FTMRS fellowship operates out of that match. Okay. Um, there are obviously more GYN led programs than urology. Um, could you talk about the cross training? and the core privileges, particularly hysterectomy for a person graduating out of FBMRS? Yeah, again, that varies by program. Uh, it had currently not been a requirement that all urologists graduating with FBMRS credentials would have, have to do hysterectomies. Uh, I think that varies from program to program. The urology programs uh, will also, based on our history of what, what female urology and reconstructive surgery has been in urology, we also see men, obviously. And so you can get credit towards this FPMRS or some of the other reconstructive neurourology type procedures. So programs will be weighted differently and that's one thing that an applicant would want to look at that is different than the oh, most of the uh, i would say ob or euro gynecology programs are are pretty consistent with in terms of their formats and what they offer um but just so you know there's a there's elective opportunities within these fellowships and what i see fellows doing is sort of pursuing the elective part of their training with in areas that they feel are they're more particularly interested in and might want to continue to do um, in their practice. Uh, I think that's uh, been a wonderful opportunity, particularly my involvement with the IVU and other groups that fellows have been able to go to learn and train for fistulas, which may not be as common in our country here in the US. So those are type of electives that certainly are fellows participate in and going abroad and, and learning in areas. Um, but it's not a approved mission from the RRC, both for residency and fellowship. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that's something, uh, whether the society helps or not, would be something we need to look forward to. I, I agree with you. I think that there's not only opportunity for education, but there's just a huge need in, in, in the, you know, global surgical needs that I think that we could really, uh, we could really help with. That's my, my own personal opinion. And I think especially in the area of female pelvic medicine, reconstructive surgery, you know, there have been, there's been talk at the level of the RRC and, and there's hope that maybe uh, the urology RRC would begin to look at these international rotations uh, and allow the cases, you can get credit for your elective portion, but you can't get credit for the cases that are part of your core curriculum for the fellowship. Um, interestingly, the uh, uh, OBGYN uh, RRC, uh, uh, to my understanding, does allow for credit uh, for, for cases towards your core uh, surgical procedures. So, there, there's precedents out there, and um, maybe we will yeah, be able there's to... Surgery and plastics also have it, so um, urology is as yet um, behind on that. Yeah. Um, are we training too many or corally? Are we filling all the programs uh, with the urology trainees? So let's see, in 2018, 19, which is the data, the last data that I had, we, um, as urology, we filled... 13 uh, programs or 15 of the positions uh, out of 19 positions were filled. So we had four unfilled positions. Um, and, um, you know, the, the urogynecologist had 46 positions and they had five unfilled. Um, so, you know, I think that what we're really 
what we'd really like to see in urology is we'd like to see more applicants in urology. And I think SUFU is really trying hard to figure out how to, um, you know, it, it, one, of the, one of the problems is exposure to the field. I mean, we know in urology training, we're all gonna be exposed to the stones and to the cancer, uh, but there are many programs that don't have uh, a urologist who is doing female pelvic medicine and therefore the, the residents um, don't really get exposed to that. Um, I know Sufu has done a good job of mentorship and uh, the, particularly the senior resident course. I find uh, most of the applicants have been through that and that's how they got interested. Right. So we have two program. We have a we have a program where we will send a visiting professor uh, to a program that doesn't have female pelvic medicine, and that that person can work at the site with those residents. Uh, and then we have, like you mentioned, the preceptor course, which is every year for. In the past, it's been I think third year residents. Uh, we're thinking maybe if we did it even earlier, um, you know, maybe a second year residents that we would be able to there'd be time for uh, people to, uh, you know, to consider it. And so they come for a four day course in female pelvic medicine and part of it is a hands-on laboratory and the other is, is lecture and get an opportunity to meet all of the national uh, leaders in female pelvic medicine. We're starting early. We have a four week female public health uh, rotation for the medical students at Wake Forest. So we really? get them really early. Uh, and That's right, yeah. Two applicants um, going in in OBGYN residency with the idea of coming into female public health in the future. So uh, we're very excited for this uh, nascent program. Um, anyway, so what else do you think we should emphasize to entice more students um, in terms of coming into this field? Well, and these are going to be my own personal opinions, but I, you know, so I'm not speaking for SUFU, obviously, or for any organization. Um, but, I, but at UCSD, what we've been able to, to do is uh, team up in a truly multidisciplinary uh, collegial uh, clinic where, where all of the female pelvic medicine referrals, whether they're to urogynecology or to urology, we see those patients together in a clinic um, with the same staff and with the, uh, and with the same, we, we've developed a rotation that includes a resident from urology and a resident from gynecology and a fellow in FPMRS. And that's a team and that's a you know, three month rotation. And I think they get exposed to the full gamut of, of female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery and where that would be possible I, you know, I understand the, the difficulties in terms of the silos that our departments create and funds flow and all that, all that, it, it, it makes, it makes it difficult, but I, I would like to see um, chairs supporting that kind of endeavor where possible. Um, I think we need to have a better understanding of, of, of our, of our residents and what they you know, what are the reasons why they're not choosing to go into female pelvic medicine? And, and we're, I know SUFU is really starting to uh, investigate that in more detail, trying to get at whether it's exposure, whether it's the fact that it, it's perceived as being a gynecological specialty instead of a urologic specialty, uh, whether people are just fatigued after a five year residency and just don't see, you know, another two years as being. Uh, something that's, you know, worth doing. I think they need to emphasize the market demand. I mean, I get emails routinely from so many programs looking for FPMRS trained faculty that uh, out there, there appears to be a, a need. Yeah, um, I agree. Uh, which is, you know, somehow we need to emphasize that this is, and also the fact that this is one specialty where open surgery is still part of your training, where less and less open surgery is done in other subspecialties of urology. So, um, Dr. Abu, any parting words uh, for, uh, for Urology uh, Times or, or well, your yeah, I, I, I would say that urology, we are at a crossroads with this specialty where we have to decide whether we're going to double down and keep that in within our specialty 
or whether we're going to, um, you know, abdicate our role and have only the unique sort of urologist, sort of like we have we, what's happened with transplant. Sure, you can get urologic training and then go do a transplant fellowship, but it's really all run by the general surgeons. And I think we have we have our our urology input into the research in this field has always been uh, in, incredible and very very important and uh, our colleagues around the world who are urologists are still doing it and I just think we need to make the commitment as a specialty that this is that this remain in our bailiwick and that our residents continue to get training in it. I thought you know what would happen is with the robotic influx into this specialty that urology would have once again a leg up based on the fact that as urology resident they're better trained robotically than OBGYN when they come out and that they would be able to adapt to this. Uh, but that really hasn't happened that I've seen so far. Yeah, I, you know, and I think what we, we also have, you know, it's, it's a little bit about our referral patterns, you know, because, um, and that changes, you know, from place to place. You've got some places where all of the incontinence goes to, you know, the, urogynecologist where and in other places um, it, it goes in a different direction and so we have to be there at the forefront we, and I think we have to do it with the urogynecologist we're not going to be able to do it and just say you know we're our own thing on our own path with that and have nothing to do with them. I think the model you described is exactly what we have we have a joint unit same physical space everything is combined the fellows rotate on a team that includes a urologist and a urogynecologist. So um, each week they have a A team and a B team and both teams have one of each, um, which then allows them to constantly go back and forth. Um, and that's the model I think is a real model for the future. Yeah, yeah. 